So we're back on, on the subject. Um, Matthew 26, we pick it up from there, where we left off. And we have some very significant, very emotional, very critical uh, events to look at today. Hope we can get them all in, we'll see. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing on us. We need your blessing. We need the enlightenment of the Spirit. And especially we pray, I pray this morning, as I need assistance in presenting this lesson. And, and I pray that we may, as much as possible, understand the situation our Lord faced. We can't understand it completely. But to the degree that the Holy Spirit reveals these facts, Help us to apprehend them this morning. So I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, we stopped uh, two weeks ago. We stopped two weeks ago at uh, the Lord's Supper when the Lord's Supper was instituted and spent some time going over the different interpretations of the Lord's Supper. Uh, and I read to you uh, verses 30 and following. But we didn't get time to cover that. So we're going to do that now. I didn't want to get into that. Um, so let's go back and look at verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it's written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Uh, verse 30 links back to what we saw with the institution of the Lord's Supper. Uh, remember that I, I told you that the Passover was a fixed liturgy. It, it was the same every time they would meet every year. They would have the same prayers, the same uh, cups passed, the same uh, meat. All this is, is fixed, it is the same. But when they got to the point about midway through the ceremony where they all ate uh, the Passover meal, Jesus just simply de <laughs> departed from the liturgy and went a totally different direction, which probably shocked them. And then he said, this cup is my blood. This bread is my body. Uh, that wasn't in the liturgy. So from then on, among the disciples of Christ, uh, this becomes very different from the Passover. It is the Lord's Supper, as we know. So at the end of it, they sung a hymn. It is thought, many think, that he went back to the liturgy then and they sang the second part of the Hallel, which is, is a praise, uh, part of the uh, praise songs. It's Psalm 115 to 118. And they went out to the Mount of Olives. Uh, we don't know the name of the person in whose house they met for the Passover. And I suggested to you the last time we met that probably that is to keep Judas from going. Because if Judas knew, it's very likely he would bring the, the soldiers in and arrest Jesus and interrupt the, the, the Passover. And Jesus wanted that time with his disciples alone. So, uh, but this suggests to me that the, the place they met was near the Mount of Olives. So they went there. And Jesus said to them, you'll all fall away because of me this night. Because it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That is a prophecy from Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. There are 63 clear messianic prophecies. 300 that might be, but 63 that are absolutely clear. A great number of them are fulfilled this last week. And it's amazing. Jesus didn't go through and pick out the prophecies and then deliberately manipulate the events 
uh, to coincide. They happen. They happen by the sovereign plan of God. But it is true that all these prophecies were fulfilled. God, God struck the shepherd and the sheep were scattered. Which tells us that they're going to leave, go out. But I want you to look at verse 31 again, this verb. You will all fall away because of me this night. You will fall away suggests they're going to leave, and that's true. But there's a deeper meaning to this word. The verb in the Greek is skandalizo. And that is the word from which we get the English word scandal. The word in Greek means a death trap. When you go out to trap animals, uh, to, to eat them, I suppose, but whatever, a death, a trap that would close in on the animal and kill the animal. Uh, so he literally is saying to his disciples, you're going to be trapped this night because of me, not because of them, but because of me, because of Christ. Uh, Christ called them. And when he called them, he knew what was going to happen. So uh, he put them in this predicament. Now, how were they trapped? They were in a situation that was, they couldn't get out of it. To go one way is to deny Jesus. Uh, and by denying Jesus, they might escape death at the hands of the Romans. To go the other way is to stay with Jesus and be arrested and put to death. So that's a no-win situation. And Jesus is telling them, you're right in the middle of a trap because of me, because of the fact that you are my disciples. Now they did leave, but look at verse 32. After I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. That would suggest that they're going to come back and they're going to meet him up north, where they all came from, in Galilee. Then Peter, the impetuous one, spoke up, as he always did, and said, though they all fall away because of me, I will never fall away. I'm confident of myself. I've, I have got the strength. I can do it. I will not fall away. And Jesus said to him, truly, I, I, I tell you this, uh, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Peter said, oh, no, 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 I will die with you. I will never deny you. Something very interesting I want us to notice. Uh, there are four Gospels, four accounts of these events that we're looking at now. I went back and looked at all four of them. It's remarkable how similar, especially uh, what we're about to look at, the situation in Gethsemane. Yeah. Very interesting. But at this, this particular section, Luke gives us much more detail. And I think we learned something of tremendous significance that affects us as well. So turn over for a moment. We'll take up too much time with this. But it's most interesting, most valuable, Luke 22. Um, look first at verse 54 and following. This is the account of what Jesus is telling Peter is going to happen. Quickly look over it. Uh, they took Jesus, led him away, brought him to the high priest's house, Peter following at a distance. And when they kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man was also with them. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I don't know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You are also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted saying, this man was also with him, for he's also, he's a Galilean. And one of the synoptics says his speech betrays him. They had a different accent up in Galilee. And Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. The account in Mark says he cursed and swore at that point. And while he was speaking the rooster crow. And of course, he, knew what he'd done. He knew that Jesus had correctly prophesied. He denied Christ. 
three times, no doubt about it. Now look back at verse 31. This is before th this incident. Uh, this parallels to what we had in just a moment ago in, in Matthew when Jesus told Peter ahead of time that's going to happen. This is Luke's account. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. You can imagine Satan wanted Peter. Look at verse 32. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, some versions say when you have con been converted, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, this, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny it three times that you know me. Satan has demanded, Jesus as God knew what Satan was up to. He demanded to have you, to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. What do we call that kind of prayer? Intercessory. Intercession. Intercessory prayer. That's right. And it works. One of the most comforting thoughts for us as Christians is the fact knowing that Christ intercedes for us continually. And John says that God, the Father, always hears the prayers of the Son. Always hears, always answers. So if Christ prays for somebody, then God will answer that prayer. He prayed for Peter that his faith would not fail. And then he said, when you turn again, or when you're converted, and he didn't say if you're converted. He said when you're converted. Significant. He knows that he will come back. So Peter denied, but Judas also denied. Two men denied Christ that night. Peter denied three times, even with, with swearing, and Judas betrayed him. Judas didn't return. Why did Judas not return? Jesus did not pray for Judas. Now this sounds horrible, doesn't it? To say he didn't pray for Judas. But there's an interesting passage in the 17th chapter of John. We call that the great intercessory prayer, high priestly prayer of Jesus. John chapter 17. And the first part of that prayer, he prays for himself. Second part, he prays for the disciples. Third part, he prays for those who will believe on him later, which would include us. But in the context of that, he says in verse 9, I am not praying for the world, but for those you give me out of the world. We as Christians today rest in the confidence because we have come to Jesus by faith. And Jesus said in, in John 6, all the Father gives me will come to me. We rest in the confidence that we are among those the Father has given to the Son for salvation. And thus those for whom he prays. And our salvation is thus secured. He does not pray for the world. Sounds harsh, doesn't it? I am not praying for the world. You see, a high priest interceded for the same people that he offered, for whom he offered sacrifice. He was given a people to save, and he's going to save them. He will save them. And how do we know, though, that Judas was not among the people whom God gave to Christ for salvation? In John 6 and verse 70, Jesus says, Have I not chosen you all, twelve, and one of you is a devil? Now, if you want to know why Christians have confidence in their salvation, why if we sin like Peter did, if we deny Christ, if we do something terrible, and yet our faith is real, that God is going to bring us to repentance. And so this is really the basis of our assurance that we will not lose our salvation. And I'd like to stop here and preach a whole sermon on it, but I, I'm not going to do that. There are many other passages that we can bring into this. Any questions? I just think that's fascinating. 
I remember, uh, and I'm going to say too much, but years ago, when we were in Church of Christ, uh, I, I went over this in a, I don't know if it was a sermon or class or something, and my son was, our son was there, and he said, Dad, I didn't realize the significance of that until now. You know, people can read that and, and not get it when, you, when Jesus said, when you're converted. Okay. But I need to come to the dark point. 36. Now watch the time. Jesus went with them. This is Matthew 26 now, 36. Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. While talking with Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane means oil press. Um, so this is, this is a, a grove of olive trees here, obviously, uh, probably with a wall around them and an olive press in the middle. Uh, there are no trees there today. When Titus came and destroyed Jerusalem in, in AD 70, he cut down all the olive trees, so they're gone. But there were olive trees then. Uh, so olive press suggests that there was an olive press, an oil press, I think suggests there was an olive press uh, there, oil press. And uh, they would, you know, the first pressing was the best, the virgin olive oil, or extra virgin, what the difference is, but, and then the so subsequent pressings were not as pure as that. Oil, olive oil was a valuable commodity back then. Um, so he goes into the garden and says to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. So he, he puts actually eight of the disciples at a certain point. This is point number one in the garden. And then he goes farther, taking Peter, James, and John, that inner circle, and he stops there. And he tells these three, he, he confides in them, my soul is sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And then he alone goes farther. I'm going to stop there. Um, Charles Spurgeon wrote, Here we come to the holy of holies of our Lord's life on earth. This is a mystery like that which Moses saw when the bush burned with fire and was not consumed. No man can rightly expound such a passage as this. It is a subject for prayerful, heartbroken meditation more than human language. So I shall expect that we will not fully understand the emotion that Jesus felt. We'll see how close we can get to it or where the Spirit leads us. William Barclay said, Surely this is a passage we must approach on our knees. D.A. Carson said, As his death was unique, as his death was unique, so also was his anguish. This is anguish that nobody else has ever or will ever. It is a hushed worship. Understand that our Lord was fully man and fully God. He experienced this as a man. This is, he experienced this as, as a human being. This is an expression of his human nature because 
the sin that demanded this atonement was committed by man and it must be answered by a man and yet as God he knew what was ahead and that's what caused I think this this horrible uh, sorrow that he, he expresses in verse 37 and in verse 38 he says my soul is sorrowful even to death it's as though I am so sorrowful in my soul I want to die to that point and then he goes alone that's the prayer uh, so no we can't understand it Come on. because when he talks about cup he is not talking about Passover cup he's not talking about the cup that he gave to his disciples and said this is my blood of the new covenant which we have in the community. He was talking about the cup of God's wrath. As in, for instance, Psalm 75, 8. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. This is wrath such as no man has ever experienced. This is the full of wrath of God for every sin that you and I commit for every sin of every one of God's people from the beginning until he comes again it is a horrible amount of wrath it is hell for everybody it is intense beyond imagination I heard Sinclair Ferguson preach on this one time and he pointed out from this Psalm 75 Jesus had the cup of God's wrath and he drained it to its very dregs. Isaiah 51, 22, the goblet of my wrath. Jeremiah 25, 15, the wine of my wrath. Ezekiel 23, 31 to 34, the cup of ruin and desolation. Now I want you to watch his prayer. We have, he prayed three times. He comes back the first time and finds the disciples uh, sleeping. And uh, he says, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, you may not enter into temptation. He makes a statement, and this is a side comment now. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, we've, we've folded that off, that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But why is the spirit willing? What makes us willing? He was praying for him. It, 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 it's the regeneration of the Holy Spirit because when, when we are born again, we are given a new heart and we are given a spirit that is willing. And so you and I will always be willing, always want to do the will of God, but we don't always do it. And the reason we don't is we still are in the flesh and the flesh still has its weakness. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is true of us because a Christian is conflicted. He, he has this always this renewed heart that wants to serve God but he has the battle with the flesh and Paul talked about that in Galatians the flesh and the spirit warring against each other so that's why he says what he does to the disciples to Peter but go back to the prayer again he fell on his face and prayed he said my father if it be possible let this cup pass from me the second time we've got uh, the prayer, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. The third time we don't have it, it's the same thing. And, and if you look at the others, the other accounts, very similar. Uh, as he entered this, this, this third position, as he goes farther beyond Peter, James, and John, uh, we're told here in Matthew, he fell on his face. We're told in Mark, he fell down on the ground. Same thing, essentially. He fell. We're told in Luke that he knelt. Back again to Sinclair Ferguson's sermon, which I remember so well. He said, you've got to imagine, he was physically, this whole event has left him physically weak. You know, I've had experiences where something terrible has happened and we just are physically weak. So he, he, he intends to kneel, but he can't kneel, and he just falls down. He tries to get back up again and falls down. Uh, 
Dr. Ferguson said it's, it's like it was a heaving, you know. He's up and down and up and down. He is a pitiful case of total weakness because he's facing this horrible experience of the wrath of God. Now, notice the prayer. The first time that we have it here, he fell on his face and said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. That's a conditional situation. Right? If is always a condition. Remember teaching kids grammar. If is a condition. If there's a way out, if there's any other way, but if not, let your will be done. The second time he prayed, verse 42, if this cannot pass unless I drink it. Again, conditional, if. If it cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Now the account in Mark would suggest he definitely prayed, take this cup away. I think the Holy Spirit guiding the other three as he did gets at the, really the heart of it. I do think that Jesus was praying with a condition, if, if, if. So when you pray if, that's not a specific prayer for something. It's just saying if it's possible. So look at it and see if you agree with me. Is the prayer here, is what Jesus really prayed, thy will be done. Thy will be done. Now that's the only way I can reconcile uh, Hebrews 5, 7 to that. Hebrews 5, 7 says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. See, that's exactly the scene we're seeing here. He offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. God heard him. Now, if he was praying that the cup be taken away, I have to say, well, God didn't hear him because he, the cup wasn't taken away. I think he was praying that his will be done. And it was. But it's the very fact how horrible and unbelievable was his anguish, was his sorrow, was his fear. Luther said, Martin Luther, we celebrate Reformation Day today. Luther said, no man ever feared death, like this man. No man ever feared death. When the martyrs died, Christian martyrs, or even today with martyrs, they, they face physical death. They don't face spiritual death. They don't face the wrath of God because they die with their sins forgiven, pardoned. No man died like this man. So, you see why you see why my Spurgeon said, "This is the holy of holies of our Lord's life on earth. This is a mystery. No man can rightly expound such a passage as this. It is a subject for prayerful, heartbroken meditation more than human language. Our Lord facing hell for us, so that we wouldn't have to face it." Surely this passage we must approach, Barclay said on our knees, the person said, as his death was unique, so also was his anguish. You see, unique anguish. Unique anguish. So, for verse 45, he came to the disciples, he said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. Wake up, see the hour is at hand, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Up to this point, Jesus had said over and over and over again, when he was made reference to this, my hour is not yet come. His hour had come. Let's pray. Our Father, we can do nothing but thank you for what your Son and our Lord did. We do not have the capacity to understand fully, but we thank you for what the Spirit has revealed to us. May this be a thought that we 
indeed approach with the deepest reverence, that may it be a thought, an understanding that sustains us in the darkest times, that we never have to face eternal punishment. Be glorified, Father, in all that we do and in our worship this morning, we pray through Christ. Amen. <laughs>